Thanks, everyone. Good, good afternoon. We're going to talk about the, uh, the overlay networks in the data center and the different architectures to support the overlay network. You may interrupt me during the uh, presentation if you've got any question. One of the um, important points for the universal architecture, for the cloud, for the, uh, for the overlay network, is to have a, a good um, underlay network, good fundamentals in your network architecture. You should aim at having a one network design. Often in an um, in enterprise or service provider networks, what you might have is different silos of networks, depending on the application. You might have one network for storage, one network for the cloud, another network for another kind of cloud, another network for this and that. However, there is the, the, uh, the interest in consolidating all that in a single infrastructure that can support all kinds of applications, keeping a high level of visibility. As the other networks provide any, any communication for the different layer two nodes, then you would have a, an increased mesh communication. You might lose visibility on the traditional isolated uh, traffics, so you need to gain, improve your visibility across your network, or keeping, keeping everything open and standard to avoid going into some technological dead end to make sure that you can keep innovating on your network, don't close road in front of you because your added value is innovation. So keep the uh, innovation on your network. When you were traditionally, um, I mentioned having different silos in, in your network, the aim is to have on that single infrastructure that we had in the previous slide is having the IP storage wherever you want. Not necessarily in single, in single rack or in a single silo, but you could distribute your storage. You could distribute your application. You could have in a single rack have a mix of a storage, virtualization, a Hadoop clusters. Um, you could mix everything. The important point is that in that infrastructure, you allow the same level of performance, the same level of um, you can have different SLAs if you want, but the SLAs performance are not limited on where they are physically. You can attain the same level of performance everywhere you are in the network by having the same amount of bandwidth, any to any, the same le level of latency, any to any. The idea of generalizing the term maximum generalization is about using some um, commoditized hardware and common protocols so that it's easy to repeat, simple to scale up. In the, the, the term innovation is all about best of breed, keeping the, um, the different elements in your infrastructure at all level, from the hardware, from the server, from the networking, from the different application, the, uh, the best of breed in your network. And to integrate all those best of breed elements, you need to keep your infrastructure agile so that you can move them, so that if one day this block of your architecture is not the best of breed anymore, you can move it, replace it with something else. So this is the idea of having your application and your different layers, including networking, compute, agile, not the idea of a single silo um, vendor lock-in where you had tradition, well, some, some, some customers are going for, uh, for this environment, it does provide you, um, legitimately, the whole working stack together. However, then you are um, reliant on that vendor for providing the continuity, and this has proven a, a challenge for the, uh, for the overlay networking, for example. In this picture, we've got that idea of the universal cloud, um, the, the universal underlay network, with the, the physical uh, network, providing, you know, you've got your compute, you've got your storage, that are supporting all your applications. Whether it's virtualized, represented here as Intel squares or VMs, but all those applications, the cloud, the big data, the, the VDI, some maybe some HPC clusters you've got somewhere, all that can run on the same physical platform. All are driven by um, the management, the cluster management, the orchestrators, driving the applications, driving the virtualization. But also, 
through some standard uh, protocols, also driving the infrastructure, not just the compute and the um, and the um, and the storage, but also the networking infrastructure. Those mechanisms for those um, for those cluster management, different orchestrators to drive the networking infrastructure. You've got a mix of different Linux tools. You've got some APIs. You've got VSDB. You've got different open protocol that are um, being driven from so open source orchestrators or commercial uh, cloud management platforms. And the idea is to have an end-to-end -end automation, not just the application itself, and yet it's another silo of management for the computer, the storage, and yet another one for the networking. That brings a, an evolution in the um, in, in all the job of networking people. So I assume every, every everyone here is a networking um, has got a networking background, and compared to um, so I if you were to go to to a um, you know an open stack or a, a server community where everyone has been doing automation for years and years, you know pixie boots, everything has been automated for almost a decade, virtualized. The virtualization for networking is relatively new, and automation is not something that is in all the common most. A lot of networks today are still being manually configured. There is a lot of um, manual configuration of ports or VLANs. So this is historically due to the fact that network couldn't be automated. It was all about configuring um, the, um, the ports, the VLAN, the trunk, all that manually. Step by step, as network engineers, to help us a little bit in, in, um, in automating some things, Maybe we started you know, importing an Excel spreadsheet and converting the IP addresses, or reading the loopback addresses from an Excel spreadsheet to automate that so we don't have to do it manually. Um, doing some scripts maybe to on, on your Linux server to back up all the configs. But this is still ad hoc. This is, you do it once, you do it twice. As an example, when you try to collect some granular information from a device, you know how much parsing you have to do. I mean, you, you could be an expert in, in a regexp with a BGP, but sometimes when you are looking for the, you know, the, the line number 20 after so many characters and that changed from one device to another, it's very difficult to make a script that will work for your whole network. That's why the, the networking jobs in doing those ad hoc scripts has been relatively limited to some occasional uh, requirements. And as tools are being made more and more available, for example, Puppet Chef and Sybil and so on have been used in the, um, in the compute world for, uh, for a while, but that's becoming available for the networking as well. So now, depending on the, the way your organization works, you might have a dedicated server team, or that might be yourself dealing with the servers. But those tools and Linux tools have been used extensively for many years to deploy automatically, to provision the servers and deploy profiles. And that can be used for the, uh, for the networking as well. So now it facilitates the automatic deployment of the networking devices at a very large scale. But it brings a new um, kind of a new role, a new understanding in, the, um, in our networking in a daily role. Because from just configuring VLAN ports, now we need to understand a bit even more than just the regexp and the uh, bash scripts. We need to integrate all those tools. We need to understand what the server guys, our colleagues, were doing. How are they using those tools? How can we integrate our network to those tools? Well, some of the uh, switches are easier to integrate, and we need to understand how they are doing it, not yet creating another silo of management just for the networking, but thinking a bit wider. We need to communicate, to communicate more with the server people. We need to communicate more with the security teams. The idea of a cloud is not just, it's just not happening like that. It's not happening with you, communicating more across the, team, the, the teams. And nobody is going to deploy a cloud without the networking people. But it involves more work, not just in the technology involved, but also in the organization and in the procedures. So the ideal achievement for both the physical and virtual switching is ideally the, the complete cloud orchestration with a cloud management platform as the next step. 
So before arriving onto the, uh, the underlay networking, I just want to emphasize the underlay network. Overlay network, underlay network. So uh, there is a fundamental requirement on the underlay networking, on your network, physical infrastructure to support an overlay network. Because overlay network means you will have traffic, you know, virtualization in many, um, uh, in many directions in a uh, full mesh manner. So it's important to ensure that's done right. One of the weaknesses in the traditional architecture is the multi-tier, um, um, with several layers of networking, with the other subscription that get worse as you go higher in the, uh, um, in the architecture. Any layer of a, of a subscription just get worse the higher you go. So traditionally, you might have had layer two on the top of rack, layer two on a distribution switch, and then layer three on the on the core. But if you think you've got an eight to one of a subscription here from the access to the distribution, and then a four to one between the distribution and the core, any traffic that need that comes from a from a host on the bottom goes up till the routing instance and then go down suffers so a much higher of a subscription ratio, 30 to 1, than if it's locally switched. So we don't have the same level of performance from one host in a rack to, to a, uh, another host in the same rack compared to communicating with one that's on an another rack or even in another pod. So in a cloud instance where you've got maybe VM going all over the place, you cannot afford in this, um, in, in, in this networking design to have VMs moving across because your level of performance will be degraded, your level of service will be severely impacted. And those that have tried did suffer um, performance issues. So the, the class topology here, the term is for a, a flat topology with a, a spine and leaf. <coughs> this, so Mr. Class is just a, a, a mathematical model used for uh, network distribution in general you might all know about it, but the idea is simply to scale horizontally. The principle is a leaf layer is connected to every spine. A spine is connected to every leaf, but you might see that the spine are not connected to each other because the principle is traffic always gets locally switched on the spine because the spine is connected to every leaf, so there's never any need for traffic to go from one spot to another. When scaling is required in terms of port count, then it's simply a matter of adding some leaves onto the, uh, onto the network. And as the scaling increases, to preserve that level of performance, it's possible to increase the amount of spine. So the idea is that that spine that you might know as a core when you've got just two devices is called spine because that can increase to 4, 8, 16, 32 or 64 devices in the spine for the largest network. The same network can start from a few hundred nodes, um, ports, networking ports, can scale to thousands, hundreds of thousands, using that same model. It doesn't need an old-style hierarchical model where each, um, each pod is siloed from the other with a huge amount of a, of a subscription. This is the only model that allow you to scale while preserving your performance. And this is important for the, for the overlay network because as the cloud scales, you need to maintain that level of performance. Any question? Don't hesitate to interrupt. So based on, on, on those idea of architecture starting small and then growing as you need, this is just illustrating that you don't need to start big, you don't need to, um, to be limited. This is important to keep your options flexible, but as you might start from here, you need to think about where do you want to be in one year or two years' time. If you want to be there, you just need to start right in not doing the mistake of building a multi-tier layer and to think about how you can achieve that. Simple, but just, just a matter of awareness. Now about the layer two network, why do we need the, the overlay network. In the underlay networking, there is limitation with the layer two. The layer two limitation is, um, um, we'll go to see later, are in terms of MAC addresses, VLAN, and so on. 
And you might think, why do I need overlay network? I already have a flat layer to network. I can achieve multipathing. You might, your, your ven networking vendor might use uh, layer two multipathing technology so that you don't even need spanning tree. You don't have active passive, it's active active. And today's, with today's devices with the high density of ports, you can achieve maybe 1,000 or even more ports per chassis, 10 gig ports. So you can have a very high density network. You can have thousands of 10 gig ports on your network, non-blocking. So I think, that's already my whole network. Why do I need overlay network? I've got a flat layer to network. It works fine. I've got all my subnets. Well, actually, the limitation is not the port count. The limit you, you can have 4,000 ports, LAN rate, meaning if you do some slight of a subscription ratio of 3 to 1, you can have 12,000 ports. This is a large-scale network. But the limitation is not the amount of ports you have on your network for the overlay, because well, for the layer 2 service. Because the limitation of the layer 2 service is in terms of amount of MAC addresses, amount of VLANs. How many VLANs can you have on your network? 4,094. How many MAC addresses? Well, if you've got 50 VMs per, per, per networking port, and you've got, let's say, 4,000 ports, then you are already reaching the, um, uh, what did I say, 50 uh, VM to 4,000. So you're already reaching the um, tens and tens of thousands. You very quickly reach the 100,000 MAC addresses, which is the common maximum amount of MAC addresses present on a, a top of rack switch. And you can't have um, the amount of MAC addresses done accumulate as you increase the amount of switches. They all need to share the whole MAC address table, otherwise you create some black hole at layer two. So layer two limitation is about MAC addresses that you can hold on the layer two switches, the amount of VLANs. What about ARP? How do you do the, resol the resolution? How does your tenant go out? You need an ARP resolution. And this is an even bigger limitation sometimes than the amount of MAC addresses. Those devices doing layer three are usually like for scaling. If you need to reach the 100,000 or million, then you need very large devices as as the full gateway. Again, it becomes a bottleneck because those devices you need to receive potentially if you've got, I take 1,000 1, ports, for example, 1,000 10 gig ports, but that's 10 terabit per second. You can't have just you know, a large chassis doing um, SVI inter, inter VLAN routing at 10 terabit per second. So the idea of the overlay network is to overcome those limitations. So all the new layer two protocols, well, relatively new, all the, th the uh, layer two protocols that have tried to overcome those problems, than the traditional spanning tree and Ethernet, have actually not resolved the VLAN limitation, still 4,094. Uh, the amount of MAC addresses needed, for example, Trill, as per the RFC itself, has never been built to build a large network. The only, w the only method to scale a large network is layer three. I mean, you all know uh, how good layer three, how good routing is to scale your network as a service provider. This is, this is the best protocol to scale layer three because every layer two domain is isolated by layer three. Broadcast, don't go out, you know, unknown unicast, stay there. It scales very well. However, by definition, the layer two doesn't go out. So you've got some services that do need layer two, VMs, for example, virtual machines to do the migration, or you might have different physical hosts that need to do some synchronization, some backup. Maybe you can change the application. Sometimes you're a bit um, you know, powerless in front of the customers or the system admins that are managing the servers saying, oh, they do need layer two. So how do you do? Well, I resume. The only way to scale the network at a very large scale, or in a, in a flexible manner, is layer three. But you do need layer two. That's where the, um, the concept of underlay and overlay networks comes, where the underlay network is there to provide a robust, a flexible, high performance, and very scalable infrastructure for your, net for your network to support your services. But this is a purely layer two network, of uh, layer three network. This is a, a pure layer three network. 
That's using the standard protocol that you are used to, using the same implementation, configuration, troubleshooting method as you are used to. The same standard protocol that are robust and has been you know, uh, in the industry for 15, 20 years. OSPF, BGP, ISIS, whatever you like, just routing on your underlay. Just need to do routing. And the other network is just that abstracted plan where the layer two services will be implemented. The two different um, layers are, are, are totally distinct. There is no, um, they are totally separa separated, meaning that the layer three network just carries layer three packets, it's just IP packets. While the overlay network is simply seeing a layer two traffic. A tenant in an overlay network will only see its submit, its host. We'll have no knowledge about crossing a, um, an underlay network. So VXLAN is, a, um, is a, an overlay technology. This is providing the, the overlay network. As a refresher, some of you might be, uh, might be f familiar. Um, who's familiar, very familiar with VXLAN? Most of you. Some not so familiar. It's okay. So, so <coughs> VXLAN is a, is a standardized encapsulation mechanism. You've got host 2 and host 1 on the left. They are exchanging at layer 2. The, the devices here are VTEPs. The VTEP stands for VXLAN tunnel endpoint. This is a, a VXLAN gateway. That does the gateway between the layer 2 world and the layer 3. It does an encapsulation. It takes the Ethernet frame and encapsulates it in IP. Once it's an IP packet, it's routed wherever you want. On a device that does RIP, static routing, OSPF, BGP, ISIS. It doesn't need to be layer 2 anymore once it's inside the IP network. On the other side, there is a, another VTAP, an, another virtual, uh, VXLAN terminal tunnel endpoint that will receive the VXLAN packet, decapsulate it, and forward the layer 2 frame onto the VLAN, onto the port as an original Ethernet frame. The host one sends an Ethernet frame. The host two receives that exact Ethernet frame as it was at the origin. They are seeing each other on the same subnet, on the same layer 2 domain. This is the um, frame format. <coughs> the original frame is obviously containing the layer 2 information. It is encapsulated by the VXLAN gateway into a, uh, um, an IP packet that contains a UDP header for better entropy. The entropy is the, the variety of the hashing, for to improve the variety of the hashing so that, so that the, um, for example, you can vary per flow per customer. It can be a hash of the different um, VNI. The VNI is the tenant identifier. VNI on 24 bits allow you to have 16.7 million different IDs compared to the previous 4094 limitation with a VLAN. With all the scalability of a layer 3 network rather than having a layer 2, like QNQ for example. VXLAN, the control plane works on um, Unicast very well with a mode called head end replication. Because at layer two, you've got broadcast often. Well, you, you must have broadcast for ARP requests, for example, where the, um, the, uh, the broadcast cannot be understood across, well, through a layer three network. So to carry those broadcast, ARP requests, or unknown unicast, those, they are being encapsulated inside IP, being delivered to the different VTEPs that participate into that layer two network. And the layer two network is defined as a VNI. This is the network identifier that matches a, um, a, a tenant network. These two VTEPs, for example, whether they are in the same data center or you know, in a different room or in a different data center, have got a VNI 2000. This is the network identifier for a tenant. That VNI 2000 is configured on the first, on the f behind the first switch, 
and is, is going to this one receive a uh, so BUM stands for broadcast unicast multicast. By unicast, I mean unknown unicast. Sorry, unknown unicast. Think that the switch cannot doesn't know where to deliver because there is not known destination for it. So it's going to send a copy to each VTEPs that participate into that tenant network. This one doesn't have the VNI, it has got no host, physical or virtual, from that tenant, so it's not going to send that to this host. This is how the uh, broadcast, including the ARPs, the unknown unicast and multicast are being resolved in, uh, in VXLAN on the IP network. What kind of devices can you put on those um, overlay networks? Well, you can have, you can have bare metal servers, meaning physical servers, because VXLAN just encapsulates any Ethernet traffic. But that requires a, a hardware VTAP. You can have physical storage, also requiring a hardware VTAP. And you can have physical or virtualized different services, such as load balancers, firewalls, physical Physical services will require a, f a physical gateway, physical VTAP, uh, but you can have virtualized files with just software VTAPs. And the VMs, any kind of VMs, depending on the, um, on the hypervisor. And uh, from a tenant perspective, having the VNI 2000, for example, all those different resources, whether it's physical host, physical storage, virtualized or physical services as well as uh, virtual machines from different kind can all be present on the same tenant network, on the same overlay network with a virtual network, uh, VXL network identifier 2000. They can ping each other, whether they are in the same rack, across different racks in different silos or in different rooms or different DCs. All the traffic is layer three in the between. A bit more detail, a bit less abstract on the previous slide. This is showing Two different tenants, you've got blue and green, crossing a, an IP network here using ECMP with multipathing, equal cost multipath. The, v the uh, VTAP can be in software in the hypervisor or a hardware here for accessing physical resources. Again, here I illustrate a, a router simply because, yes, those virtual machines might need to access to, to go out of the um, virtualized world. If you do not, if those VMs just need to talk to each other, VM to VM, then they, m they might never need any hardware VDAP. But if they need to access physical resources and go out, you might need to have, here you would have a trunk, you would have different layer two, VRF, you would have your existing services or um, hardware routers for performance and scale. If we retrieve the previous picture where we had the overlay network and the underlay network, you've got your layer 3 network, you know, scalable, performance, tr you're troubleshooting exactly the same way as you're doing today. This is the same layer 3 fabric that you've got today with the different overlay networks that are provided by the um, overlay solution. So. How does the uh, VXLAN overlay network integrate with the underlay? Because ideally, you know, in a, in a, uh, at the beginning, we were talking about service chaining and a way to manage everything from a, a single management solution rather than having multiple silos. You know, traditionally, even if you have been working with OpenStack for a little while, you know that you, know, you could provision in, uh, an instance with just one click to bring up a VM, but the network had to be configured manually. So customers click on spin up a VM, and then depending on the organization, it takes a few minutes or a few days to get the VLAN um, configured. So how to get that better integration between the VXLAN um, overlay network and the underlay? You've got different solutions. You've got the uh, pure um, hardware VTAB to for the um, um, for the hardware resources, either manually or automated. You've got the software VTAPs. You've got different solutions today in a, um, with different virtual switches on the, um, on the hypervisors providing different kind of encapsulation. VXLAN is one VXLAN technology. 
you've got different kind of encapsulation. You, you, you all know about GRE. GRE, however, on the host is usually done in software. You had some other technologies such as STT, but it looks like uh, most of the vendors providing the um, uh, software VTEP are uh, leaning towards VXLAN. And you've got a mix of hardware and software that requires some network orchestration. So you've got a cloud management platform that's there to, you know, to, to, to define your different instances, network resources, the different services. And those hardware and software VTEPs are kind of managed or controlled by a, um, an, an additional layer we can call the network virtuali virtualization controller. So we've got three different solutions, purely hardware, purely software. But what will happen in most of the cases is actually that even in, in any cloud, there will always be, or likely be, a little bit for uh, maintenance of requirement for some, um, some exit to some uh, hardware resources. Whether it's an existing network, because you want to preserve the continuity between physical host then to the new VMs, or because you are bringing new VMs but you've got a physical storage or you want to access your, uh, your gateway. The role of the, um, of the, um, and in the hardware plus software VTAP is a combined solution that orchestrate, that controls both the software and the hardware VTAPs. This is usually um, that, well, that can be different vendors, but the, c the controllers in the market are able to do, um, to do both. In this case, you've got different solutions for the Mac learning. Mac learning is the ability for understanding what's connected to the switch, physical switch or virtual switch, and to exchange that information so that a software VTAP is able to communicate with a Mac address that's behind a hardware VTAP. So there's that synchronization requirement through the network virtualization controller. The uh, pure hardware VTAP are usually, especially in, 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 a, in a manual configuration, suitable for small-scale data centers, cloud, or a DCI solution. The uh, pure software VTAP is suitable for a cloud. However, the consideration is that it's for virtual only, right? It's only for VM to VM, which is a, is a solution that requires, that might require some virtual gateway. The virtual gateway have got um, resilience limitation as well as performance. And the hardware plus software uh, VTAP, that requires an orchestrator, because by default, the uh, software VTAP will not be able to communicate with the hardware world, you don't have knowledge about it. So there's the, I've illustrated a few uh, common, commonly known cloud management platforms, OpenStack, CloudStat, etc. And the um, uh, network virtualization controller, a um, few of them, but those that can be dealing with the um, software networking and the um, uh, hardware networking altogether, are, for example, VMware NSX, Nuage Network, Plum Green, and, and some others. So, how does that work? In the cloud management platform of, of your choice, you would have a portal, you or, or your um, customers will be clicking resources, building networks, you know, adding instances to it, adding services, and you've got, so depending on the platform, you've got that network information, so we're just talking about networking here, is going to be exchanged to that network virtualization controller. Three different means, through some APIs, through XMPP, some way to tell, I want to build a network for host, my virtual host A, B, C. This is a MAC address and so on. And the network virtualization controller is going to, to send that, to push that to the virtual switches, if it's a VM, and if it's a physical, if it's a resource that's behind a, a, a physical VTAP, then control the physical infrastructure too. So the way those network virtualization controller are communicating with the virtual switches or the physical network is by use of OpenFlow, for example, to some um, virtual switches, or VSDB that's becoming more and more um, predominant in the way those network virtualization controller are communicating to the physical switches. 
you can have different APIs, and they are pushing the port configuration, the VLAN, the different MAC addresses, so not just how to configure it, but for the learning as well, for propagating the, uh, the MAC information. The MAC addresses can be pushed uh, proactively so that there's no learning done. Some of the other solutions will uh, work on actually doing the MAC learning on the data plane, just like on normal, uh, normal switching. And the infrastructure, so th those virtual switches and physical switches, will do the MAC learning locally for the local host and share that with the network virtualization controller. So, as a conclusion, you've got different solutions <coughs> for the overlay networking. You've got the complete stack, overlay network and underlay network, with maybe the whole chain of all the different services and different elements in your network, from the physical network, from the appliance, service appliances, from the hosts, from the networking, from the management, everything provided by the same by the same vendor, giving you almost you know, keen hand, here is your cloud. One of, one of the inconveniences on that is that it's usually well, a bit costly, while we all know that in service provider, the, uh, well, an, any network, you, you need the, the value in trying to compete against you know, the, the likes of Amazon and so on is by driving the cost down. So you need to find a solution that's cost efficient to you. Additionally, when you've got a whole stack of all those different services, well, if I can just go back to that previous slide, you are providing with one element of that, one of that, one of that, one of that, one of that, and you cannot change anything. You are reliant on that vendor for, oh, you'd like another maybe cloud management platform where well, you can't. You'd like to add new services because who knows what would happen in six months time down the line. Maybe there will be another protocol here, or maybe something better here. And that's the point of, actually, the best solution is by being able, flexible, to choose the, uh, the best of breed. The other, um, th the other option is, you know, end-to-end -end open source solution. OpenStack, OpenStack is great, but to bring all those functionalities, uh, VXLAN overlay and, and, and so on, there's a certain amount of no, um, um, customization or bringing drivers that are not in the general release yet and tuning it. And w People that have been trying it, either they've got a large and very skillful team or they struggle a little bit in doing that. So this is a, a very interesting solution, but quite, uh, quite demanding for, uh, for you. And then the last uh, option that we see as the, uh, the most appreciated is the mix of hardware and software VTAP with, with that best of breed integration. It's got uh, follow your standards so that remember the multi layer architecture where you can move, you stay agile on your network. Replace the compute if you want, replace the cloud management platform, replace the network if it doesn't perform anymore. You've got the ability to stay agile and to steer where the industry is going. And that provides with you know, working integration. More and more vendors are integrating, uh, meaning that the names before are working together in, uh, in getting that integration. Provides you the best solution between a fully, you know, sort of keen hand but a very locked in solution and the fully um, open source way where you have to do a lot of personal investment and effort. Thank you very much. Any question? Yes, question. That's going to be a difficult one. You've discussed part of it before. Yeah. Uh, so, VXLAN was invented to alleviate limitation of layer two networks, mm -hmm. number of VLANs mostly, three, four years ago. Since then, everybody's moving la towards layer three as a service. There are data centers which don't have layers of traffic at all. Mm -hmm. So, what you do with VXLAN, you're bridging layer <laughs> two traffic, which makes network engineer part of me really. Well, uh, yeah, well, um, well uh, a lot of customers that want a tenant network, want a network that might you know, rent um, either a, a managed service, an infrastructure as a service, or just they, they want to be able to sp spawn a, a network, they might not consider having a well-designed layer three network. It's part about you know, uh, edu skills, education, there is a different human aspect of 
why do we still have layer two today in any network? We should have had layer three everywhere many years ago. And you remember one of the pictures in the design is, do use layer three for your network. If you can isolate the layer, layer two within your rack and have pure layer three everywhere, yeah, you, you don't need, you don't need um, spreading the layer, three, the layer two across your layer three. But unfortunately, there are many, many, many places where the customer will push layer two and that's the only thing that we want. So since you are often in front of customer, I would really like to hear your opinion. Like, uh, th there are two serious problems with Sun. One is tromboning, so your traffic has to go to the VTAP before you can switch between VLANs. And uh, the most serious one is the ability to carry any metadata within VXLAN header, which is needed for server chaining, for many other things. So which protocol do you think is going to <coughs> take so the evolution path? <coughs> So your first question about um, the, um, the tromboning for, the default, for, 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 for going out, be, be going between the tenant network or going out onto the internet. Actually, it doesn't need to go to the VTAP. The VTAP will just do uh, VXLAN bridging, for example, going from the tenant network across the legacy network to go to the same tenant. To do the inter-VNI or to go out for the default ga as a default gateway for that tenant, there's a need for, um, for being routed. Um, it is not the necessarily the role of the VTAP. It can be on the VTAP. The tromboning aspect is that you need to choose whether you want hot potato or cold potato. You can decide to put the default gateway on the, on the VTAP itself. You can have an SVI on the VTAP to do the routing as near as possible to the, um, to the services. However, you might meet some limitations there in terms of where do you need to route later? Do you need to route to the internet? Do you need a full routing table on your top of rack? And do you need 3,000 VRF? And so you're going to hit some limitations there. So you might consider having those default gateway elsewhere, maybe on a farm of dedicated routing devices that do have large VRF table. It depends on whether your overlay network is for an enterprise and they don't care, they don't want you know, 50,000 tenants, they don't want many thousand VRFs, they just want maybe two, three VRF, one for, in, one, one for internal, one for testing, one for finance, and that's it, so three VRF. So depending on your requirement, the SVI, so routing on the top of rack, might scale. In some other environment, it might not scale. If you do require a big device that's, you know, that has a carrier class doing full BGP table with hundreds of thousands of VRF, then if that is your default gateway for your tenants, then yeah, your traffic between tenants need to go up and need to go down. This is not the direct path. So this is a balance between scaling for your requirements and optimizing traffic. So there's, there's always a, a trade-off. Uh, your other question was... So the ability to include metadata. So there are some drafts to do some of the things with some of the free fields in VXLAN. Um, today the standard is relatively, I mean what people have implemented is relatively cautious um, for most of them. In uh, There's a lot of options. I think, I think there's, there's a lot of options. Um, there's also the idea of you, know, you can have Q and Q in VXLAN. Um, metadata in VXLAN? I don't know. With the overlay networking or with VXLAN packet format the in particular? VXLAN being overlay. As an overlay. Um, the use case is the people wanting flexibility. I know as network engineers, we all hate layer two kind of. It's just because server people wanted layer two. Most of the cases, or customers say exactly, I want my two servers to be connected to each other. Yeah, but I've built a great layer three network and you want to put layer two on top of it again. But why? So, um, network engineers say, okay, I don't care about those server people. I give them the layer two, but my network is layer three, right? I don't have spanning tree, I've got OSPF, nice, BGP, nice. Across the one or inside, even inside the data center, even if it's not, not the thousands of racks, even if it's just 10 or 20 racks, they like the agility, the, the scalability, the flexibility of layer three. So just for that, they like it. And the ability to do layer two across a network that maybe 
Nowadays, VPLS is much cheaper than in the past, but still, uh, on the standard layer 3 link. Um, that's for the more enterprise network. For the large customers that do want to scale to, um, to, to very large um, dimensions, and we mentioned the limitations, cloud of 4,094 VLANs, the amount of MAC addresses that are required on the whole layer 2 domain, they want to, to go out of that. They want to abstract to the, to the layer 3. And yes, do add an ad hoc manner layer 2 services for those that do need. Some s services will not require layer 2, so there is not VXLAN for every single la layer 2 resource, only for what is needed. Some of it is layer 3, and as you were saying earlier, maybe in 10 years time, everything will be layer 3, finally. Did I answer your questions? Any more questions? Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you all.